Praise God. It's so good to be together again. You and me together talking about the Word of God. I just love it. You know what? I don't know what kind of week, what kind of day that you've been having, what you've been through, but I do know this. Isaiah 54, 17 says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. James 4, 7 says this, that when we humble ourselves before God, resist the devil, he runs from us. He will flee, the Bible says. So that's good news. And you have more power and authority than you even realize. So right now, let's just ask the Holy Spirit for His help to activate all of this goodness, all of the blessings of God. Precious Holy Spirit, we never want to take for granted the privilege we have of access to you. Help us right now. Lord, as we get into this new series called United we just ask that you unite our hearts in the reverential awe of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as I just prayed, we're talking about united. We're getting deep into this, this cultural revolution that everybody's talking about. But you know what? Only the Bible really defines the term accurately about how that we can be united before the glory of God and to experience the glory of God. You might have heard the famous saying, united we stand, divided we fall. There is no doubt, but that collaboration can be an unstoppable force in life. Henry Ford, he said this, the great industrialist said this. He said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress, but working together is success. You know, the positive and negative charges of two hydrogen and one oxygen atom attract to each other and then united, they make up this molecule called water. As you know, water is essential to life. Therefore, unity is essential to life. I can say it that way. Like after all, your body is made up of over 60% water. So yes, water is essential to life and therefore unity is essential to life. Can you just imagine if the hydrogen in your body decided to stop playing nice with the oxygen in your body? <laughs> it would be a mess. Proper unity, good cohesion produces life. It produces blessing. The next time you enjoy a hot shower or a bath and you're thinking, ah, isn't unity just wonderful? Isn't cohesion such a blessing? That's what it takes, you know, to have a strong marriage, a great family, a successful business. You got to have unity. You got to have good cohesion. I like this quote. As a family, we make, not take time for each other. That is the key to a strong chain, even though some links don't touch, end quote. Did you get that? We make, not take. We make time. And you can be a part of an amazing family without ever even touching some of the other links. But you can be part of a destructive coalition too, without ever even touching physically connecting. As we get deep into this wonderful study that we call United, we will discover that it's a very important, it's so important to know how to receive within your accord, within your alliance, but receiving is not taking. Mother Teresa said it so well. She asked the question, what can you do to promote world peace? She said, go home and love your family. She was basically saying, go home and give. Don't take, go home and give. To start us out thinking about the power of being united, listen to this short story. It's a famous fable by the Greek storyteller Aesop called Four Oxen and the Lion. It's just short. Listen to this. A lion used to prowl about a field in which four oxen used to dwell. Many a time he tried to attack them, but whenever he came near, they turned their tails to one another so that whichever way he approached them, he was met by the horns of one of them. Can you see that? At last, however, they fell a quarreling among themselves, and each went off to pasture alone in a separate corner of the field. Then the lion attacked them one by one and soon made an end of all four. The moral of the story here is simple. There are life-giving, life-sustaining blessings in good coalitions, in being united. 
The other side of the coin is there are grave consequences to being divided. The truth is there's a barbecue for your enemy when you're divided instead of being united. And you, you are the so-called guest of honor. It's like being invited to a, inviting a Texas steer to a barbecue, right? Come on, Jim, come to the barbecue. Hey, what should I wear? Eh, it really doesn't matter, right? We know what's going to happen. You don't want to be that Texas steer. Turn in your Bibles. Look at this. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. That enemy of yours, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, fiercely hungry, seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Be firm in your faith against his attack, rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You do not suffer alone. Now, first of all, Who's the devil looking for? Someone alone, somebody disconnected, someone out of unity, out of harmony. Would it surprise you to find out a few verses earlier in 1 Peter 5 that we were instructed to humble ourselves, to set aside our opinions, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that He can exalt us, that He can lift us up, that He can protect us? Would that surprise you? Secondly, what suffering are we referring to here? The enemy's attack? Well, sure, but it's more than that. All of us, along with our brothers and sisters all over the world, must stand up to the same old temptations that are tactics to divide us, just like those oxen. We are impervious, we are an impervious force to the enemy when we stand united. But the moment we act like those cows, those oxen, and give in to jealousy, suspicion, you know, the whole, my opinion is better than your opinion, envy, comparisons, matters that are based on preference and not principle, God's principle, we set ourselves up to suffer. So let's drill down a little bit on this word suffering. Do you find yourself suffering today? Whatever you do, don't let the enemy further isolate you by bringing you under condemnation. Just stop it right now. If you're suffering, don't feel under condemnation. That's not where this is going. There is no condemnation in Christ. So shake that off so you can hear the truth. I want you to hear the truth. God wants you in His family, protected, covered, directed, surrounded, united. If you're suffering in any way, this series called United is strategically just for you. So let me, let me tell you straight up right now. God's kingdom is united, but it's united around His principles. And that's so important. Not human opinion or preferences or even experiences. That's why in the family of God, people of all backgrounds, creed, color, age, and traditions find themselves united in Christ. Like that song we sang, We are many people, but one voice, trusting in the Lord. It's our choice. We are many faces, but one tribe. Jesus is our king, and we live his life. You see, it's a spiritual principle that nothing stands when divided. The enemy's attack on your family, your life, our nation, it's intended to divide us away from his principle, truth, and integrity. Let me put it ultra simple. You cannot be truly fulfilled, joy-filled, or even happy without good cohesion, good connection, unity within the body. I like it. The late comedian George Burns, he had a famous quote. He said this, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. <laughs> You see, all joking aside, we try to laugh at our inability to be united because we know deep down it's so important. Society has this habit of using self-deprecation to ease the pain of failing to be united. How many comedies have you watched that are basically entirely based on division and separation, divorce, breakups, family mess-ups? It's not an old story. The religious leaders 2,000 years ago, they tried to discredit Jesus. You know how? By manufacturing a fake link to the devil, just like today's entertainment industry, desperate to feed you a false reality. Look at this. 
Jesus is talking and he's defending himself in Luke chapter 11, verses 17 and 18. And he says this, but Jesus, well aware of their thoughts, talking about the religious leaders and their purpose, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is doomed to destruction and a house divided against itself falls. Verse 18, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand and continue to survive? You know, even the CEO, the president of all evil, the devil himself cannot survive or tolerate a divided house. Does that speak to you? I mean, this is Jesus telling us this, informing us of this. Successful CEOs in Fortune 500 companies have achieved extraordinary success by just eliminating the silo mentality that so subtly invades organizations and cultures. It's impossible to be successful, no matter how much talent you have, no matter how good your product is, no matter how strong you are, if you stand alone or with the wrong partnerships. Life is a team sport and the enemy of humanity is seeking those he can devour. Isn't that what we read in 1 Peter 5? The enemy is seeking those he can devour. Silo thinking is stinking thinking. Why? Well, because it's isolated and there's no movement. Life needs movement and flow, just like we talked about water. Water needs to move and flow. Sameness is not unity. If water doesn't move and flow, it grows bacteria. It becomes poisonous. It becomes totally unusable. So this silo thinking is twisted thinking. Who wants two left-hand gloves? How about two right shoes? Do you, do you put on pants with two left legs? That's just weird. That's just weird. Look at a football team. They all have the same jersey on, but it's not the same. They have different numbers, different identities on their back. They are different sizes for different talents and different strengths. Even the coaches on the sidelines are all different, but united for success. What unites them as a team is not sameness, but alliance, team, team name, team mission. We, you and I, we are united under one name, the name of Jesus. Not our opinions about Jesus, but rather what the Word of God says and articulates about Jesus, being King of Kings and His mission for us, His purpose for us. Yes, you have a sure identity in Christ as a child of God with all of his family benefits. Let me tell you, friend, you are the original you. There's nobody else like you. Your fingerprint, nobody else like you. And yes, you have a sure mission on Team Jesus to be united into his family, his ecclesia. That's where we get the English word church from, the Greek word ecclesia, which means governing body of envoys and ambassadors. That's you on assignment to represent the King of Kings. That's Jesus. You and I are on Team Jesus. That's what unites us, not our proximity. Man, I'm getting excited about this. You have an amazing calling on your life, but it requires the family name and you being in, united to, not divided from the body of Christ, His governing body, His church, meaning His ecclesia, not a building with a parking lot and a steeple on it. There's nothing wrong with that. But too often we've turned the true message of ecclesia into being united around organized Christian property management. Did you get that? You see, discipleship is extremely important. But if we as leaders are putting volunteers to work on a Sunday morning to basically operate a building called a church, let's be honest, that's not discipleship. I've had volunteers that are so busy serving, they're not receiving, they're not growing, they're just giving. And that's not a sustainable model. It's not a healthy model or God's plan. It's good to give, but you can only give what you have. You're called to be part of the King's, King Jesus, Ecclesia, and that requires true discipleship. So let's drill down on some core values of the King's team, because if we're going to be united, we got to know what we're uniting around and into. An essential part of being united and being discipled is knowing the core values. Core values are the fundamental beliefs it could be of a person, an organization, a nation, or a family. These are your principle and absolutes that guide your behaviors, your decisions, even your tolerances. For example, when a nation places great value on human life, 
They do whatever is possible to protect every life, making laws that align with those core values to protect all human life, regardless of who it is. But that core value also mandates an intolerance of behavior, actions or decisions that might do harm to or endanger any life, positive and negative charges, cohesion. Do you see that? The positive and negative charges coming together, what we tolerate and what we don't tolerate. You know, maybe you're one of those extremists that, that won't tolerate livestock in your house, right? You can see sometimes we have these subconscious, unconscious intolerances that we live with. Maybe you don't allow cows or horses in your house, but you know, we live with them, but we don't realize there's certain things we are intolerant of. Core values steer results. They steer outcomes. Remember, when the oxen let go of the core values that once had united them, their coalition, their agreement, they steered toward their own destruction. The world says, you know, anything that makes you uncomfortable, challenges your opinion or bias, it must be eliminated from your sphere. So we eliminate all the wrong charges that we need. So we run away, we isolate, we maybe join a weak or possibly even an evil coalition that welcomes sameness, devouring lions, smooth talking, bias confirming barbecue goers, and you're the main course. You do not know that the rancher always feeds the steer before he turns it into a prime cut, right? Don't you know that? The rancher always feeds the steer before he turns it into beef. If you're feeding on confirmation right now instead of correction, you're not in the family, you're on the menu. Being united God's way in God's kingdom, it should attract good things, but it must repel bad and evil things. The priority of being united should be a core value for every person on earth. We need each other. We do. God himself said this. He said in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. Other translations said not profitable. Think of this. God spoke those words regarding Adam when Adam had full unbroken relationship with God. So it wasn't that Adam was alone, but he didn't have another human, a different human type as a companion at that point. Do you have a relationship with God, but yet you still feel alone? Psalm 68, verse 6, I love this verse. It says that God places you in so places the solitary in family. God doesn't leave orphans and widows alone. He will not forsake you. God will not forsake you, my friend. So don't be hard on yourself right now. Say no to condemnation. You just haven't plugged in this core value, this wisdom, but God provides you so that you can be united. The core value that sets you up to be united, God's way requires two important things. Remember with water, right? The negative and the positive charge. Number one, biblical parameters and boundaries. Simply put, the guidelines for wise associations and assignments. This is the positive charge. Biblical parameters and boundaries. That's the first part. But then number two, an intolerance of anything that interferes with you being united. That's your negative charge. You need to have both of those in your life to truly be biblically united the right way. Otherwise, there's no way of knowing if you're truly doing it correctly. How do you know if you scored a goal in a game if there isn't a net to determine your success? How do you know if you're in bounds or out of bounds if you don't have lines, markers? So how do you know if you're truly united according to God's standard according to God's good design, if there aren't team rules, game rules for success. And at the same time, guidelines for what you would need to be intolerant of or else you could find yourself united or grafted into an evil coalition. Positive and negative charges for cohesion. Man, that's even scientific, right? There are people that proudly say they are humane. I'm compassionate. They're tolerant souls. And yet, in the same breath, they tolerate laws and ideology that remove protections, even kill the vulnerable and the innocent. Now, many don't see those dots connected the way, that way because their core values are not connected with the straight edge of God's word. That's called being self-deceived. 
How can I throw a basketball in the air? Listen, I can throw a basketball in the air and score a basket every time as long as there's no basket to measure my success. We can easily fool ourselves into thinking that we are moral when we remove the standard for morality, subjective morality. What a convenience. What a confirmation. The problem is there's no life in that. It's death. Now let's look, let's finish up here with an amazing story from the Bible in Genesis. It's called the Tower of Babel. You've got to hear this. This is amazing. Genesis 11 verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth spoke one language and used the same words. And as the people journeyed eastward, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. So they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build a city for ourselves and a tower whose top will reach into the heavens and let us make a famous name for ourselves so that we will not be scattered into separate groups and be dispersed over the surface of the entire earth as the Lord instructed. Ooh. Verse 5, now the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And now nothing, do you hear that? And now nothing they have imagined they can do will be impossible for them. This is God talking. Come, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go down there and confuse and mix up their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the surface of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, the name of the city was Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the entire earth, and from that place the Lord scattered and dispersed them over the surface of all the earth. Look, we're going to come back to this story in Genesis throughout this series. There is so much to learn from this story and to intentionally unlearn in our lives from God's wisdom in this powerful anecdote. I want to land part one of this series united with three powerful observations and conclusions from this story of the Tower of Babel. Number one, being united as one people with one language and one plan makes it so nothing, nothing is impossible to you. Dr. Henry Cloud said this in his book, Boundaries for Leaders, quote, values make it possible for a guiding language to develop that gives instruction and identity, identity to the boundaries of behavior we want to encourage and prohibit. You see, the people of this story had a guiding language that helped them unite around an evil plan. So when you're united around wrong or evil core values, your outcome will be unlimited wrong or evil. But if you are united around the guiding language of God's word, you attract the outcome of unlimited, nothing is impossible, good, blessing, benefit, protection, joy, life in Christ. So let me ask you this question on point one. What language are you united around? Is the culture leading you or is the Bible your standard for life? Number two, being one with the wrong people produces a dark unity. Yes, an evil unity, an evil cohesion. Wrong associations lead to the wrong language, lead to godless plans, producing a harvest of pain, destruction, loss. Much suffering will come upon you. It's not God's plan. It's not God's will, but it comes upon you. You know, the German people in the 1930s and the 40s justified extreme amoral compromise of life for a leader, language, and plan that united them under an ideology based on, quote, for the greater good. You can hijack basic personal freedoms by a seek first the greater good kind of unity. It's wrong. It's sin. It's definitely not the kingdom of God. Jesus said this, seek first the kingdom of God. So let me ask you these questions. Who are the people in your life you find yourself united with? Do they seek first the kingdom of God or do they seek first their own opinion? Do they have their own version or subjective kind of morality? Let me give you a little side note here because I think this is important. This challenge can manifest in families, but this is why Jesus came. 
to give us all his name, a blood transfer. He gave us the family blood transfer, and you cannot save your loved ones by staying united to crazy or bankrupting your values to accommodate family sin. Okay, there's a lot in that, but I'm going to move on to number three, the final one here for this part one that we've learned from this story, the Tower of Babel. Number three, being or feeling scattered could be God's mercy moving you out of wrong alliances. Oh, my goodness. I felt that personally. Consequences can shock you out of wrong thinking, which can introduce intolerance for bad patterns and behaviors. It can do that. It doesn't always do that, but it can shock you. And now you find yourself energized to move into the right agreements, strong coalitions based on right language, the language of faith. You know, listen, don't, this is what I say, don't, don't waste a good tribulation. Don't waste a good tra uh, trauma. Second Peter's Verse two, um, chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, that Lot, remember um, Abraham's nephew? Lot, Abraham's nephew, tortured his own soul, brought great pain upon himself by living with wrong associations and relationships in the wrong place. My dear friend, there are wrong relationships for you, and yes, wrong places for you to be. So here's my question on point three. Are you in an alliance right now? that is inviting a scattering? Is it better to hurt for a moment or suffer harm for a lifetime, an eternity? I know a family that redefined truth and moved away from biblical core values in order to accommodate their son's immorality. The end was tragic because the family ended up disintegrating and scattering like dust in the wind. You cannot live without the straight edge of truth. You cannot last. You cannot endure divided from the truth. It's like saying that you can divide. You can be divided from water. Your body will just fall to the ground. You can't. Many people get sick from dehydration. You are a top priority to God and to us. God put it on Pam's and my heart to help you be united into one people, God's amazing family, speaking one language, God's amazing word that produces faith, all in one plan, God's amazing will for your life, your home, your family, your health. Here at Living Room Church, magnifying and worshiping God is our joy, and to encourage and strengthen, to cover you is our mission. Jesus said this in Matthew 28, verse 19. I love it. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, cultures, and people. Living Room Church has a simple assignment to help you, encourage you, to cover you, disciple you, to see you united into God's way for your life. So how do we do that? We unfold and focus on God's word so you can grow and live life strong. At Living Room Church, our mission is identical to the simple Bible process that we lead you in. Receive God's love, grow in God's love, give God's love. Have you ever seen an apple tree live strong without first receiving rain, nitrogen, nutrients, sunlight? You got to receive. Fruit is the outcome of receiving and growing consistently over time. Like I said, you can't give what you don't have. Our passion is to spiritually cover you, bring you value, bring value to your true identity and encourage you in God's great plans for your life. We're on assignment to help you and reach your highest potential in Christ Jesus. You might be thinking right now, Stephen, where do I start? My life feels like it's just been scattered and even shattered in so many ways. People see me on the outside and they don't have a clue of the pain I'm feeling on the inside. My friend, you can start right here. I mean this very second by coming to Jesus. King Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. He said, I'm going to relieve and refresh your soul. My dear friend, you've been carrying the weights of life far too long. Let go and let Jesus carry what you can't carry any longer. Let Jesus fix, repair, heal what you're so tired of, maybe what you're ashamed of. You might ask, how do I do that? You use your delegated spiritual authority to activate a transfer. Hmm? 
Pastor Stephen, you make Jesus the Lord of your life by believing with your heart and confessing with your mouth. You lay all your burdens down by coming to Jesus in faith and making that legal transfer with your confession. Yes, that's how powerful your confession is. Just bow your head and say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you now more than ever. You died on the cross for me. You were put in the grave for me. After three days, the Holy Spirit raised you up out of the grave. I believe in you. Forgive me of all my sins. I repent. That means I change my direction. I begin a new life in you today. Take all my burdens, all the heavy weights I can't carry. Into your hands, Jesus, I give you all my life. I call you Lord and Savior. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. See, now you're a child of God with every legal right to all of his family benefits and privileges. You're united in the king. That's exciting. You need to keep receiving, growing, and giving, though. That's part of your design. It's how you increase more and more and more. It's how you live life strong.